many people, when they have the opportunity to kill their enemy and get a hold of him and tear him apart, and then they don't do it. Some people would say, well, he's cowardly. But David, the king, proved that's not true. Very important. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, and we discover some very interesting things about the Lord in the Old Testament. Absolutely amazing. We're going to study this. Numbers are uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24 in about five minutes, so stay there. Corey is coming up in 20 minutes time. Corey? I'm taking a look at Saul's actions in 1 Samuel chapter 28. Ryan? Today I'm studying the bone-chilling account of King Saul's visit with the witch of Endor, also recorded in 1 Samuel 28. Oh, that, that'll be good. This is a good one again today. Janice? My title is a quote of David's. Who can understand his errors? All right. This is a good one. Let's open up our Bible. Listen to what God is saying to us. First Samuel 24, 1 through 10. Now it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines that it was told him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took three thousand chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend to his needs. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Then the men of David said to him, This is the day of which the Lord has said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. David also arose afterward, went out of the cave, and called out to Saul, saying, My lord the king! And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Indeed David seeks your harm? Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave, and someone urged me to kill you. But my eyes spared you, and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. 1 Samuel chapter 24, verses 1 through 10. First Samuel chapter 24, chapter 25, 26, 27, 28. This is amazing. Now, what does it mean when we say, I follow God? How does that someone do that? As a follower of God, how one lives and responds reveals much about what they actually believe. Now, this is a question David explored when David was defending Israel. He was considered by many to be the enemy of Israel. However, the truth is, he was the best hope for Israel. I mean, King Saul considered David an enemy because he was jealous of it. As soon as Saul did what God called him to do, which was to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines, he turned his attention, Saul did, to capturing and killing David. This reveals how we can also make the same mistakes like Saul. When we make decisions based on life's circumstances and how well others are doing, we don't think about following God, do we? David also made decisions, but he learned in his time of running from Saul to make those decisions carefully, following the leading of God and not the will of man or his own will. 
I want to tell you that is so important. Now, I want to encourage you that if you don't have a Bible guide, write for yours. Very important. I've been pushing this a lot because I want people to get a hold of their Bible guide and begin to read the Bible. You can call or write to us. Another way you can do it is go to Bible Discovery TV. When you go to Bible Discovery TV, click on the page. It's on the front and it'll take you to a donate page. Thank you for your donations. But then it'll take you to another page where you can download it just as we printed it. So you can either write call, get it sent to you, or you can actually go online and get it and be with us in seconds as we discover will of God or men. Father, help us today as we focus on the, the attention of this particular topic. We need to focus our minds on what you're telling David so that we can see that we need to maybe change some things in our own lives. I know I do. So help us, Father, today in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray these things. And we said together, amen. Now, as we go through this and learn about David and some of the things he faced, we learn about God's king. David will be measured to the other kings when they come later. David will be measured. They will be measured according to David. Very important. So let's learn what he learned. Let's try to anyway. 1 Samuel 24 verse 1 says, now it happened. When Saul had returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. And then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all of Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave. And Saul went in to attend his needs. He had to go to the restroom. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Oh, th this is the day which the Lord said to you, David. Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as you will, as seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Now, this is fascinating. Rather than harm the king, David chose to cut off a piece of Saul's royal robe. You see, there are times when circumstances seem in our favor, but it's not God's will to do it. Now, let me, let me explain this. David is there and he's like, these men say, oh, this is it, man, go in and kill him. David gets in there and God's beginning to deal with his heart because the one thing that David has that the other men don't understand is he has a respect and a love and a covenant with God Almighty. That supersedes anything anybody says because they were wrong. There was another day God had chosen for David to be king. It was still to come. All right, let's go on to 1 Samuel 24, verse 5. It says, now it happened afterward that David's heart was troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. The Lord's anointed to stretch out my hand against him seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and he went on his way. Now, David's heart was convicted and did not allow the plans of his men to advance against Saul. <laughs> this is really important. This is a leader right here. We must follow the convictions of God's places in our hearts through his word above all else. Beloved, that, that's the reason that we believe Psalm 107, 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. We've got to keep ourselves from destroying ourselves by saying, oh yeah, this is it. This is it. Maybe it's not it. We need to pray about everything before we move forward. And believe me, I'm someone who's made those mistakes so many times. And I've had to learn, and I'm still learning, how to not jump at something when it's there. That's a great temptation, but I have to pray, Lord, is this what we're supposed to do? Is this what we're supposed to do? And if God says, no, I need to not do it. Very important. All right, let's read on now. In chapter 24, verse 8, David also arose afterwards. and He went out of the cave. He called out to Saul, saying, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped 
with his face to the earth. This is, this is incredible. And he bowed down before the king. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men who say, indeed, David seeks your harm? Look, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave. And someone urged me to kill you. But my eye spared you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. You know, that is the big thing that David understood. Knowing Saul was the Lord's anointed held deep meaning to David, beloved. That's why he's a leader. David's decision not to hurt Saul, who was trying to kill him, when he could have, was a result of God's action, not his. Did you get that? Because David is responding based on God's action in his heart, not his own action. Now, later on in David's kingdom, he'll make a few actions that aren't very good, but he'll learn from it. And beloved, that's how we are. We need to learn from our mistakes and say, Lord, I need to go forward in your will, not in my will. Very important. So as we consider this today, what the Holy Spirit has told us, let's pray and say, Father, it's hard for us because everything around us says, take what you want and go with it. But Lord, we don't want to take what we want. We want to do what you've told us to do. There's a big difference between doing what we want to do and doing what you told us to do. <laughs> Help us to do that today. In Jesus' wonderful name, and we all said together, amen. This character of King Saul, this historical figure. Now, I think it's probably fair to say that most of us, uh, when we think of King Saul, we think of the bad guy foil to King David. But an entire book of the Bible is also dedicated to mostly his reign. Of course, that's 1 Samuel. So I'm really excited to jump into it today and see what we can learn about Saul. Welcome back to the program. Today's reading assignment is 1 Samuel chapters 24 through 28. And my focus is on chapter 28, which documents King Saul's visit to the witch at Endor. And you know, there's some important things that we need to pay attention to here. And just to give you some context, in this passage, Saul is seeking spiritual guidance. But since the prophet Samuel has just recently died, and since God will not listen to him because of his sin, Saul decides to turn to a witch instead. And he asks her to conjure up the spirit of Samuel. Well, in a surprising scene, the Bible records that Samuel actually shows up. Or did he? Well, that's the big question. Was this a real appearance of Samuel, or was it a demonic deception? Or was it all just a hoax? Well, let's see if we can figure this out. In 1 Samuel chapter 28 is found the bone-chilling account of King Saul's visit with the witch of Endor. Saul, who is on the verge of losing his kingdom to the Philistines, visits a medium whom he asks to bring up the recently dead prophet Samuel. When Samuel appears, the witch is frightened. Verses 12 to 14 record the scene. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, What is his form? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and does not answer me. Therefore I have called you, that you may reveal to me what I should do. Samuel then prophesied that not only would God deliver Israel and Saul into the Philistines' hands, but also that the very next day he and his sons would be dead. The mystery here, of course, is whether this was a real appearance of Samuel or not. 
Those seeking a natural explanation point out that the witch, either herself or with an accomplice, could have easily imitated the prophet, since his figure, age, and dress was well known. They also argue that the figure was some distance away, and Saul, being prostrate, could not have seen or heard him clearly. Those, however, who accept this as a genuine spiritual experience believe either that this was only a demonic imitation of the prophet, or that it was Samuel himself brought forth by God Almighty. The latter view is supported by two biblical facts. First, the witch was terribly frightened, implying that this was not a result of her own power. And second, and most important, the prophecy given by Samuel was later fulfilled, and only God knows the beginning from the end. So it seems likely that this was a legitimate appearance of Samuel, and that conclusion is somewhat troubling because God makes it absolutely clear in his word that any sort of witchcraft is an abomination. But we have to remember that God is not encouraging this practice here or anywhere in the Bible. Rather, I believe God here is demonstrating that his power is far greater than any other, and that he is the God of gods and the King of kings. I believe God is also demonstrating that only he has the ability to genuinely call up a true spirit of a departed person. Anything else is a deception. So let's stay far away from anyone who practices such things. I think it's important to remember a lot of people use this passage to manipulate it and to encourage their dabbling in the cult. But mm. we need to understand that, that first of all, when God does this. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, it is appointed once for a man to die and then face judgment. God does this, but God is having to use extremes right now because of Saul's mm -hmm. total dismissal of God's, <laughs> you know, sovereignty. Very interesting. Right. Okay. Corey. Yes. We're going to continue talking about this mm -hmm. because I'm not done with 1 Samuel 28. I think it's too weird to be done with. So, look, I think it's fair to say that 1 Samuel 28 is a chapter that brings up a lot of questions, right? This chapter records when King Saul had exhausted all his options for inquiring of God through the priests of God. Uh, and these things are listed as dreams, Urim, and prophets specifically. So dreams like King Solomon had of God when he offered sacrifices at the tent tabernacle, and then God appeared to him in dreams that night. Urim, as in the Urim and Thummim, these stones used only by the high priest of Israel for the leaders of Israel to receive direction and prophets, so waiting to receive a message through a proven prophet of God. None of these methods had panned out for Saul, and we know why. It was because of his excessive sinfulness and his refusal to repent, Saul had been cut off from God, and he was about to face judgment. But rather than accept this silence, a desperate Saul finds a medium and goes for a visit. And the result is that the true Samuel, who is dead and gone by this point in the history, appears and gives Saul the very last message from God Saul will ever receive. And it's a prophecy of his death, which of course comes true. But this is a really weird account for a few reasons. The medium's divination or process of calling Samuel up, it's not detailed at all. It's not even mentioned, but it worked. The real Samuel seems to have showed up and have had a conversation with Saul. Does this mean that necromancy is real? Some Christians deny that this was really Samuel who appeared, but I don't think that position is acceptable because there's no hint in the text that I can find to show that this was some sort of fake Samuel. And the word that Samuel gives from God was accurate. A prophecy from beyond the grave is kind of an awesome concept, but back to the main point here, Samuel really appeared. So is this God rewarding paganism? Is it showing us that necromancy is legitimate or that mediums are okay? No, I don't think so. We can see through this that God will sometimes use unconventional methods to get his point across. God can talk with and through anything and anyone. Think Balaam and the donkey. It's God's prerogative to do these types of things. So then in 1 Samuel 28, advocate is, sorry, is 1 Samuel 28 advocating the use of mediums to get messages from the spiritual world? No. The scripture is very clear that trying to communicate with the spiritual world other than through God and his approved ways is wrong. 
Uh, let's read Deuteronomy 18, verse 9 to 15 to prove this. It says this, When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in with witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. The nations you will dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. Okay, now to take this discussion in a slightly different direction now, I have heard arguments from Christians who say that the spiritual things from outside of Christianity are really just things that have been stolen from the people of God. So the idea is that things from the occult or things from the new age are counterfeits of real spiritual gifts. And therefore, we can rightly dabble in the occult and new age practices to experiment with redeeming these actions or acts for God. But everyone hear me now. This is a very bad idea. It will end in pain at best and in judgment at worst. We need to keep in mind the action of Christians in Ephesus recorded in Acts 19. As a result of the true gifts of the Spirit being practiced in the city of Ephesus, the scripture says, a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. Christians are called to turn away from pagan practices not towards them. That is right on perfectly. Mm -hmm. uh, and th that's very important to do. And by the way, if you like this program, click like it on YouTube. Uh, remember we're on the website at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. We're always there. So, uh, but that's good, Corey. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Janice? Saul has been chasing after David to kill him. And David has his army, Saul has his army, and an opportunity affords itself that David could have easily ended Saul's life. We've read about it. We've talked about it. The verse, 1 Samuel 24, verse 6. Now it happened afterward because David chose. You can almost hear it. Sometimes when you're in a situation and people get around you that you you all feel like you're on the same team, you could almost hear it. Kill him, kill him, kill him, mm -hmm. kill him. And you know, David had been running. Mm -hmm. David was tired of running. Kill him. And you know what? Somewhere inside was probably like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I can't. I can't. I'm just going to cut off a piece of his robe. And then I'm going to show him and say, hey, look, I could have got you, but mm -hmm. I didn't. And you know what? He did that. I'm glad that he chose that. But then later on, when he thought about it overnight. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. He knew, he knew he was convicted in his heart that what he had done, even in that action, was wrong. Sometimes it is easy to be influenced in the moment or by the majority of those who happen to agree with a point that, that you agree with and you can get all charged up. But we need to have God's word hidden in our hearts. We need to, if we claim to be Christians, those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ, then we need to know what would be right in that situation, not in our own eyes or in the eyes of those around us, but to follow after God. A beautiful Psalm written by David is Psalm 19. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I would encourage you to do so after the program today. But I'm going to start at verse 7. And the psalm itself is called the perfect revelation of the Lord. Listen to what David pens. And this is where I got who can understand his errors to title this segment. David says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. 
The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. David knew that. Verse 12, David switches and he says, who can understand his errors? And then he speaks to God, cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. And verse 14, let this be our prayer as well as David's. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Well, there is a place called Pastor Rod Hembry. It's on YouTube. And I would encourage you to go to YouTube and you can find Pastor Rod Hembry and you can subscribe to that channel because we have videos there and everything, the program's there now that we don't air on television that we want you to see. So uh, make sure that you do that. It's a regular feature and thank the Lord that you do that. Excellent. Today we need to pray. Lord, continue to help me through the power of your Holy Spirit to know the difference between your actions and my desires. <laughs>